Um, I'm not sure if anybody has heard me talk before. I'll try and keep it. I'll try and do it different every evening because otherwise I'll go mad. Uh, but essentially, um, I get asked a lot. Um, I'm Irish, quite clearly. Uh, there was a time when I would have been afraid to come into a place like this without waving my passport and promising not to blow anything up. But I think we're all <laughs> over, we're all over that now. Um, but uh, I, I, I guess well, why would you not write about Ireland and crime? And the real difficulty is that we're, Irish people have never been very good at crime. Tried it, not not, terri not, not terribly good at it. Um, our first brief moment when we thought we might have got the hang of it was 1950, when a group of men led by Joe McGuinness in Boston robbed the Brinks Company of over $2 million in cash and bearers bonds. It was the largest robbery in American history at the time. The McGuinness gang was caught because, uh, yeah, that's a lot of money to count with a dry mouth, so they sent guys out for sandwiches and beer. And they were driving through a suburb called Tawanda, and they saw an abandoned lawnmower. I say abandoned, someone was mowing the lawn and the phone went off, and they thought, you know, I'll leave the lawnmower there, you know? And they stopped, and, uh, and they thought, look, somebody's left a lawnmower on that lawn. And taking the view that a man with a lawnmower will never want for friends, uh, they put the lawnmower in the back of the car and they drove off. <laughs> and this being a nice suburb, people were looking out the window and thought, yeah, a group of Irish guys have just stolen a lawnmower from that garden and they called the police. And the police pulled over the car and told them to open the trunk. And when they opened the trunk, there was the lawnmower, along with all the guns and masks used in the Briggs robbery. So, okay, so we had a brief moment where we thought, hey, screw you Italians, the Irish are here. Didn't last very long. We, we tried our hands once at hijacking. You know, we, uh, uh, only once has Aer Lingus, our national airline, ever been hijacked. And it was hijacked in the 1970s uh, by a former Trappist monk. And he had the plane <laughs> redirected to Le Touquet Airport in France. <laughs> and when asked what his demands were, he said he only had one. He said he wanted the third secret of Fatima revealed. Now, for those of you who are Protestant heathens, the Virgin Mary is supposed to have appeared to three little girls in Fatima and given them three secrets. And the first two were, la di la di la, you know, but be nice to your neighbours and try not to kill people. And then it was supposed to be a really big secret, which uh, not to be much of a secret after all. Anyway, he really wanted the secret revealed. And so there is a piece of film, which they still show us on Irish television occasionally to cheer us up when things are going wrong, of Albert Reynolds arriving to deal with the hostage crisis at the 2K airport. And Albert Reynolds, who was, later became our Prime Minister, but at that time was Minister for Transport, was also best known then for running a chain of country and western dance halls and owning a number of dog food factories. And therefore was not perhaps the first person whom one would turn in the event of a hostage crisis. So there's a little piece of film of Albert arriving at the airport and a very posh journalist in the Telegraph newspaper kind of comes in front of him and says, Mr. Reynolds, do you know what's happening? And Albert said, well, as I understand it, a man has hijacked the plane. And the journalist says, well, do you know what he wants? And Albert said he wants the third secret of Fatima revealed. And the journalist said, what is it? And Albert said, it's a secret. <laughs> at, at which point, a chasm of understanding gaped between <laughs> Ireland and England once again. And everybody in Ireland nodded sagely and thought, what a stupid question, you know? <laughs> um, but finally, this is from the newspaper that I used to work for, the Irish Times. Um, and this is, is proof positive. This is from the trial of a man named Lee Crow. And about four years ago, Lee Crow wandered into a party in Clonmel in County Tipperary with a shotgun uh, because he was having an argument, a dispute with somebody who was, was, there was a woman involved, as there always is in these things. And so he shot the bloke and injured the woman. Killed the bloke and injured the woman. And this is the guard, the sergeant, the Irish police sergeant, giving evidence at Lee Crow's trial. Sergeant O'Reardon said that when Crow was interviewed, he asked Gardy what evidence they had against him. They told him he had been identified at the scene. Crow replied, that's bullshit, nobody saw me, I had on a balaclava and gloves. Now, <laughs> are you sure you want to be a criminal, Lee? Are you sure you work that out? Um, so, so there's a very good reason why I don't tend to write about Irish criminals, because we're just not very good at it. Um, and also, you know, when we write about criminality, crime writers make criminals much more interesting than they really are in life. Criminals are kind of pretty hideous people. You know, most people can hold down a regular job. You know, we, we can go out without pumping somebody with a rock. But, you know, criminals are not generally very interesting. And if you wrote about them the way they really are, nobody would want to read it. The great example of this is Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, who was a, he was a serial killer. He used to pick up young men in Midwestern bars and, and, and kill them. His idea of a good night in was sitting on his couch with the head of one of his victims on a cushion beside him, watching Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Not even a good Star Wars movie. If it was Empire Strikes Back, you think fair enough, but Return of the Jedi, the man was clearly mad.